Thank you, Neil, and congratulations, Kat. I think we need much more, much more time for your presentation. Uh, but um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Actually, yesterday I was absolutely devastated to hear from Richard Green um, this bit of information which I had never heard, which is that Sydney Cove is women's country, matriarchal country, uh, and this plays very much into why you know this area was colonised and colonised successfully. So that's just a little... Uh, Extra, extra thought. Uh, okay, great to, to see everyone here. Perhaps you came because you thought you were going to see some kind of ventriloquist show with a singing woodblock. Uh, but uh, that's for later with Eugene Ugetti. Um, so um, I'd like to say that artistic research at times has been uh, regarded as a kind of disciplinary area which requires a sleight of hand or perhaps a ventriloquist trick to establish its value, and this is kind of underlies quite a few of the discussions that we've had so far in this conference. Um, and, you know, as Kat enumerated and others, you know, we have seen uh, this rise in the last 15 years or so of this, uh, this area called practice-led research, artistic research uh, in Australia, the UK, Canada and Europe. Uh, and, of course, you know, this expansion of uh, the, the, the realm in which artists can operate in terms of accessing research grants, in terms of having their work recognised through the award of PhDs that bring together research practice, uh, yeah, practice, uh, theory, philosophy, for instance. Um, but as many have already said, uh, the relative use of this area leads to questions about its validity and value and about what artistic research is, what it produces. And actually, I would like to turn that question around somewhat and ask what might the practices of composition and performance, underpinned as they are by a focus on knowing through doing, offer to our understanding of research in the broader sense as a mode of inquiry. So to turn around that, that question of where the value lies uh, Henk Borgdorf, uh, who's one of the key scholars in this area, uh, unfortunately couldn't join us at this conference, but I wanted to start just by showing a few of his defi definitional statements about artistic research. So as he says, um, it is connected and affects the foundations of our perception, uh, our understanding and so on, relationship with the world and other people, and he links that to this term, the realism of artistic research. Secondly, artistic research as material thinking, as a kind of embodied knowledge, and he connects this intriguingly, I think, to this term non-conceptualism. Thirdly, artistic research is not about theory, but about thought. I think that's a rather beautiful way of, of, of looking at it, uh, directed more to not knowing or not yet knowing. Uh, it is to do with the unthought, and he connects this to the term contingency. So this is from his book, Conflict and Faculties. Um, this is available online, a very uh, a significant tome. So as you see, there's this pairing of terms, perception, realism, material thinking, non-conceptualism, the unthought, contingency. That may all seem quite abstract, but in this talk, I want to give some quite concrete examples of the first term of each pair. And through the second of the terms show how centrally important and useful and valuable this knowledge sphere of artistic research can be. So first of all, perception, realism. When we talk about perception, we're talking about our sensory apparatus and how we relate to the wider world and process it through the senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, moving. All of these allow us to be in contact with everything around us and to make sense of the world. And more than that, our sensory perception is what animates us. It allows us to live, to respond, to evolve. It allows us to thrive. So a very famous quote uh, from Gregory Bateson's Steps to an Ecology of Mind, first published in 1972. Uh, this is a, a, a fragment of it which is, which is much quoted in uh, the cognitive psychology literature. So he says, suppose I'm a blind man and I use a stick. I go tap, tap, tap. Where do I start? Is my mental system bounded by the handle of the stick? Is it bounded by my skin? Uh, does it start halfway up the stick? Does it start at the tip of the stick? But these are nonsense questions. The stick is a pathway. 
Stick is part of a whole system in which one has to take into account all of the elements of the body, the object, the street. Uh, and as he says, to explain the behavior of the man, you will need the street, the stick, the man, the street, the stick, and so on, round and around. So Bateson's story shows us the seamless relationship between body and mind, you know, that you can't find a clear demarcation, a cutoff point, uh, as well as the relationship between prosthesis and environment, and the reciprocal relationship between perception and action in the body as it is extended into the textures of the world by a stick or any other kind of prosthesis. Uh, and so you have this, this tool, let's say, uh, which is able to substitute sight with touch, with haptic kinetic sensation, as well as the auditory sense as it taps on different surfaces. Uh, Professor of Philosophy, uh, and who's one of the key thinkers in distributed creativity and cognition, Andy Clark, has coined the term wide wear to describe these kinds of cognitive and cross-modal extensions of body and mind. Let me give you a more familiar example of wide wear. I've started driving again in Australia after not having driven for, you know, 10 years. Uh, and uh, it's pretty scary. And I find that to survive in traffic, I really have to extend my proprioceptive sense, that is the sense of where my body ends, right to the boundaries of the car. I have to co-opt all the tools I have around me, which may be the mirrors and the camera at the back and this whatever beeping instrument there is, uh, transversely. I have to become car, otherwise I'd be slamming into traffic all the time. Uh, so that's another example of this, this idea. And that's an example of the realism of perception that Borgdorf talks about as it relates, okay, to driving, but I also say composing, playing, and listening to music also require this supersensory enlargement of our perceptual processing. Let's look at some aspects of this real, this realism in music. There's no good place to stop there. Um, OK, so that was part of the gig from perhaps the most experimental of Bach's cello suites, number six and D, uh, where the cellist is faced with myriad challenges in simulating polyphony on a solo instrument. Uh, and as you can see, any path to mastery of this music requires this negotiation and the development of technical skills to maintain the coherence of the melodic line while suggesting harmony and counterpoint. And uh, what's so amazing when you, you know, there's such a ubiquity of video around on YouTube, but when you watch this video, you really become aware of all the skills of coordination and timing that the, the performer has to negotiate, how they must drive or navigate on the terrain of their, of their instrument in order not to crash, let's say. Here's another piece that will seem as re far removed as possible from this Bach cello suite, and that is Helmut Luckermann's Pression. This is a score published in 1972. Here's the first page. Uh, so it's one of the classic works of 20th century cello repertoire, Pression or Pressure. It's a radical reimagining of the cello from the ground up, and it's really the, ground, the grandfather of what we think of as uh, extended technique in, in music, and particularly string music. Uh, the score uses graphic notation, action notation that choreographs the um, movements and positions of the performer. And you can see uh, just in this first day, there's a, there's a little diagram of the cello from the cellist's point of view. You've got the fingerboard, that's the bridge, there's the tailpiece. Uh, and the, the notation shows the, the action, the choreography of the right and left hand. So the right hand is bowing the bridge, that's the bridge there. Left hand is moving up and down the fingerboard and so on. It goes into, into more complex combinations. Let's have a little look at that. Thank <laughs> you. 
and sorry for that short excerpt, you, you can actually find, um, I think, about 12 uh, versions of performances of this work uh, online. Um, so Luckerman said, composing music means inventing an imaginary instrument. And in this piece, he's really interested in arriving at what he calls a radical idiomacity. Uh, so something that really arises from the physical practice of engagement with the instrument. And so this is music made up of actions and gestures. And to analyse this music is to analyse its, its performance. Uh, one of the interesting things that comes out of the extensive research literature, literature around this piece is the, the realisation that the gestures, for all their radicalism, uh, still point towards classical performance the performer is still drawing a bow over the instrument. And even if that, that movement or lifting the bow creates a noise, it's still, if we say that the meaning of this work lies in its gestural language, it still uh, has this relation to uh, a traditional past. Here's a different kind of classic. This is John Rose and Hollis Taylor's work from their Great Fences of Australia project, 2002. There's an Australian image. Oh, sorry, it's gone. Um, so here we see uh, a stringed instrument enormously scaled up uh, so that the human performer is bowing a string or barbed wire that stretches over kilometres in the Australian outback. Um, and so the sound of the, of the string is conducted through the fence post and it's resonating uh, on a body which is the earth itself. It is this absolute mega cello, let's say. Um, and the work's conceptual power lies in the way aspects of the classical tradition are defamiliarised by the environment, the way in which the realness of the world is made into art through the mediation of the artist. So there we have three very different works that connect to traditions of string playing through codes of the body and codes of instrumental functioning. We could describe each work's research orientation in terms of the way it opens up new avenues for a heightened and elaborated sense of perception in the Bach to illusions of multiplicity. In the case of Luckerman, at this prioritization of gesture of the haptic and kinetic sense. In Hollis Taylor and John Rose's work, there is this opening up to sound and space at this really cosmic scale. In these examples, we have music in which there's an expansion of sensory capacities that I think open up a very for me, luminous space, a space that allows the process of perception itself to become perceptible and that allow elements of the real to take on powerful symbolic significance. So that's this perception realism. Now the second pair of terms, material thinking and the non-conceptual. So we've seen in these three pieces of work, um, material thinking at work, the aspect of the body and the instrument becoming an indivisible whole, each a prosthetic to the other in this sensing artistic project. Uh, not that dissimilar from this previously described relationship between uh, stick and the unsighted person, the car and the driver. And it's quite easy to point to the material aspect, but what about this non-conceptual uh, that Borgdorf brings up. And you might say the work by, um, by, by Bach, by Luckenman, by Hollis Taylor and John Rose are all highly conceptual works. And so they are in terms of artistic proposition. But where the link is between the terms material thinking and non-conceptual is in how they're absolutely tied to the physicality of its realisation. And in these examples, we see these elements of the real, the performer's body, the instrument, whether it's the wood, hair, fencing, wire, earth, and these are the conduits of the conceptual. Ecological anthropologist Tim Ingold says about artistic practice that it is a form of knowledge that comes from thinking with, from, and through beings and things, not just about them. There's actually um, a really fascinating website. Um, he's, uh, Tim is at the University of Aberdeen. You might like to look up. Uh, it's a five-year funded uh, European um, Research Council 
project called Knowing from the Inside, which, which is looking really at the, the ways in which knowledge is generated in the, at the interfaces of, of practice. Um, okay. So one of the things that Tim talks a lot, talks about a lot, let's take this back, um, Uh, yes. Uh, okay, sorry. Let me find it again. Okay. Um, so in relation to, to Tim Ingold, he says, knowledge cannot be transmitted um, directly because the idea that knowledge is transmitted separates out that knowledge that is transmitted from the practitioner in which it is enacted. Uh, so, you know, this goes back to this, this idea of thinking of things through with Yes, this interpretive relationship, a transductive relationship uh, between, between different modalities of the senses. Um, so in music, for ideas and knowledge to mean anything, they have to be encountered and processed by a body. And minds and brains are absolutely linked to bodies. They don't exist you know, apart. The brains don't sit outside of bodies. Uh, the ways in which the practitioner joins forces with knowledge to assimilate, remake, and enact it is what skill is all about. This is the form of knowing from the inside that, that Ingold talks about, of understanding in practice, which, as we all know, is actually the commonplace of musical learning. I'd also like to extend this idea to the listener and to audiences. And if we move away from this model of transmission, you know, a kind of mysterious uh, idea in which, for instance, we often say about listening to music that music causes emotions, to a situation in which we say that listening is about constructing emotions within us via, an, by, via aesthetic play, it's actually a subject of a, a really interesting book um, which has yet to be published by Justin Christensen. I will show references later. Sound and the Aesthetics of Play um, coming out next year. Um, we can see that for listeners as well, there is this process of bodily reception or transduction, of filtering, interpreting, remaking through individual and I would say even collective perspectives that lead to, to knowledge. So this takes us back to this ecological picture of wide wear, where ideas are not things that operate in the abstract, but absolutely need to be partnered with the surrounding fabric of everything to make sense. Whether we are composing, performing, or listening, there is this aspect of partnership. And I think artistic research foregrounds this practice of co cognitive partnering. We now come to this third pair of terms, the unthought contingency. So, you know, where the first two sets of terms are really about uh, perception in and through materiality, uh, this is something slightly different. I'm in agreement with Borgdorf uh, that a crucial value of artistic research is the capacity to think things that are as yet unthought, to imagine things that don't yet exist in the world, that actually don't have a reality in the world, to think things through um, contingent logics, thinking that is synchronistic, revelatory, divergent and left field. And the sciences too also benefit from this kind of playful experimental thinking. A favourite example is that the two Nobel Prize winners, Andre Geim and Konstantin uh, Nosolov, and they were mucking around with sticky tape and pencils at Manchester University in 2004 uh, and in the process discovered graphene, one of the most remarkable substances uh, a molecular thin layer of graphite with um, properties of strength, transparency, and conductivity, which everyone says is going to completely transform, you know, all of our screen-based technology and how we build things. Well, wow. um, so they used, um, yeah, sticky tape and peeled off very thin layer of graphite, uh, and then peeled more of the graphite off with. Uh, from, they stuck another bit of sticky tape and then peeled that off and kept going until they arrived at this extremely thin. You know, you know, molecular level flakes. Any child could do that, but of course, it takes a Nobel Prize, you know, thinking to realise what it what it might mean. Uh, so yes, this ex this playfulness of experimental thinking, and in fact, Sir Andre also won an Ig Nobel Prize, that Sciences Prize for research that makes you laugh and then think, uh, for levitating a frog with magnets. <laughs> So talking about animals, this is a phrase I really love. When I'm playing with my cat, 
how do I know she's not playing with me? Uh, so this is John Cage with his cat, Losa. Um, so that comes from French, Renaissance French writer and philosopher Montaigne, whose writings often feature thought experiments uh, which take other points of view in relation to experiences, beings, and things. Uh, this very speculative thing, what would it be like if we could see it from the other, the other side? And for me, art making, including composing, involves this kind of play, this mode of aesthetic play that allows us to experiment with thinking and feeling. So we cannot directly access the cat and its inner world or in the case, going back to that Bateset example, the sidewalk, or in fact the road with its traffic. Our mental system includes our sensory and material extensions to interpret, to transduce, uh, to convert these things into things which are understandable for us. We may need new <coughs> capacities to do so, and that is what skills are. Skills are not just techniques, they are capacities. Uh, and using those capacities, we can know things by remaking them for ourselves. Ecologist philosopher Timothy Morton, in his book, Realist Magic, this is from 2015, says, uh, when you make or study art, you're not exploring some kind of candy on the surface of a machine. You're making or studying causality. This is quite a radical statement. The aesthetic dimension is the causal dimension, and uh, he takes a whole book to unpack that statement. Uh, Peter McCallum uh, made a joke yesterday uh, in his fantastic um, presentation where he said, you know, you should be able to uh, judge the sciences from, you know, the, the, the artistic, their artistic value, and that's actually what Timothy Morton says. He says the sciences, in this model of thinking about, you know, how we must always have an interpretive relation to everything because we can't access it directly. He says sciences, the sciences are actually a subcategory of the aesthetic. So that's something. Um, so knowing anything is, I said, a pathway through the world navigated through heightened sensory, perceptual, and profoundly relational intersubjective logics. Morton's work points out the operation of what we think of as the aesthetic is um, the proper realm of reality. So objects which are things, humans, other living entities, but also kind of quite ungraspable uh, conglomerations, institutions, the weather. He writes a lot about climate change. Um, are both themselves, you know, we can apprehend them, but also not something we can access directly, not themselves. There's a gap of contingency in that we can't know everything about them uh, and that we require, you know, all kinds of prosthetic uh, kinds of relations to them in order to approach them. Um, what I find exciting about Morton's work in what's this whole area, a fairly new area, which is called object-oriented ontology, or actually the study of how things exist, is that he also extends this aesthetic frame of operations outside the human realm. So non-human things can also act on and interpret other things. Uh, the cat has its frame of reference and capacities for knowing the world, which will be different from ours. But uh, I could also see ways of extending that to say the cello also has its, in its own way, its own existence, or life as a cello, in which it too samples the world from its perspective. When I play the cello, how do I know that it's not playing me? And I think in the greatest performances, there is this unification between player and instrument and a kind of blurring of identity, you know, where we don't know where one, uh, one, one ends and the other begins. So I'd say that's a rather catalytic way of seeing the world, that everything is part of an extended, distrib distributed network or meshwork, that's one of Ingold's terms, of potential meanings and relations. And this way of thinking, this way of thinking as intertwined meshworks of energies and relations is very much part of how um, I also work in my creative process as a composer. Um, particularly my focus on intercultural practice and collaborative relationships with performers and instruments. And for me, there is a really strong aspect of learning through a kind of improvisational creativity, which is about encounter and developing these new capacities um, for, for doing, imagining, knowing. That's really key to how I work 
uh, with others. When I collaborate with a performer, I'm, I'm uh, really not interested in, in that situation where the performer just offers, oh, here are some techniques, here's a bag of tricks that I then go away and, and compose with. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of blurring the demarcation more in, in terms of the roles. Um, and I'm interested in a mode of practice in which I, with the performer, with the instrument, are tapping into a current of exchange in which every aspect of the material, the object, our presence in the room, our conversation, uh, really act on each other and combine to make tools, tools of perception, tools for thinking, tools for feeling and imagining, tools for making. Uh, and for me, this, the value of this way of working is that it enables one to encounter very surprising things, and this is the element of contingency that I'm always looking for. We finally move to the Promise Woodblock. Uh, many composition courses uh, have an exercise uh, where you have to write for book woodblock. This is Michael Smetnin's Composition 3 exercise. Um, it's a, he's given a rhythm uh, and... Uh, one of the reasons uh, why woodblocks feature in a lot of Composition 101 is because it's an incredibly reduced, stripped-down situation. You know, we can really focus on one parameter. It can hear rhythm. Uh, it's kind of the, the antithesis of a cello. Um, as a teenage beginner composer in the early 80s, I was given a composition exercise by jazz legend Brian Brown to write a piece of woodblock and trumpet. And so the challenge there was to combine this very simple percussive instrument with the sustained pitch instrument. And here it is. <laughs> so here's the score, 22nd of January 1980. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, so in this uh, exercise, I'm exploring techniques and colours of both the instruments, looking for ways in which they can relate to each other. So the, the trumpet is a percussive instrument, the woodblock is a sustaining instrument. And this example actually became the basis of a, a set of videos that I made for Speak Percussion um, for their masterclass series, which addresses um, high school kids. So the whole series of exercises. Um, I talked about this work. I also talked about a much more recent work called Speak, Be Silent for violin. Uh, it's a violin concerto where I actually asked the same question. How can I combine something like a woodblock with a singing instrument like a violin? And at the same time, I was um, making an opera and I had this whole chorus of woodblocks. So, you know, it's, it's obviously some kind of re re recurrent obsession. Um, it perhaps also shows how very early experiences and suggestions uh, can leave very strong imprint on one's creative thinking, you know, the suggestiveness of, of kind of early, early uh, encounters in, in um, learning. So making these videos and working with the percussionist Eugenie Getty uh, prompted me to look even closer at this uh, seemingly humble instrument. And uh, we had a kind of uh, question, a thought experiment. Can the woodblock sing? And that set, off, set us off down this path of looking for sustaining sounds and ways of modulating that sound. Um, so we had this um, uh, workshop in January, and a week later I was so excited I'd written um, a whole piece, a uh, piece for solo woodblock. Oh, not this one, sorry. Here's the score. Front of the score, okay, it happens to be one woodblock, but there are many implements involved. There's a bow, there's various kinds of sticks, um, a, a super ball, and so on. Um, so that's a notation of the or, uh, listing of the implements and various techniques that were developed. Um, and then a notation, um, and rather like the Luckenman, a notation of actions in the right and left hand. So you've got a, a, a two-line stave, right hand on the top, showing movement of the figure, fingers and nails, left hand with a bow. You can see all these jetés. It actually looks quite like a cello score. Um, Eugene pointed out that the woodblock has a mouth, and by opening and closing the, um, this mouth, rather like a trumpeter with a wah-wah mute, one can modulate the sound in different ways. And the discovery of the woodblock's vocal capacity um, for modulation led me to introduce a text into the piece. Get rid of that. 
Here's the text. It's um, a fragment of um, Eliot Weinberger's An Elemental Thing, and it's about the stars, you know. This incredible, it goes, it's, it's like three pages. It's an incredible enunciation of the ways in which people have enculturated the stars, these, you know, kind of magical but unimaginably remote things and have read and seen patterns and stories and meanings into the stars. So that's the text. And then this is how the text appears in the score. Here we are. So the text is not spoken by the percussionist, but it's translated into phonemic shapings of the woodblock mouth opening. And percussionist uses various implements to create sustained sounds that are then modulated with the arm, the wrist, the fingers, the hand, sliding across the opening. And the notation shows open for this little round um, circle. That's open, that's closed, and the wiggly line shows relative movement uh, on, the, on the opening. So through all these experiments, I became really hyper aware of the materiality of the instrument, the realness of the instrument, articulated through perceptual scales of touch and rhythmic movements. And then language provided a further cross-modal reference that builds another layer of meaning into the work. So the pieces are thinking with and through the block's elemental structure, translated with prostheses, think of that Bates and Stick, the various implements, the parts of the body, and also the text into this mutual performance with the musician. Um, I'm going to ask Eugene Ugetti now to, to come up and perform the work. This is actually the second performance. It was premiered in Brisbane just a few days ago. Um, welcome, Eugene. Eugene. <laughs> So Eugene is the artistic director of Speak Percussion. Percussion, yes, Speak Percussion. He's also, as well as a, percussion, a fabulous percussionist I've known a very long time, uh, also a composer. Recently had a fantastic, um, huge work called Assembly Operation at Arts House in Melbourne, uh, looking at aspects of contemporary Chinese culture. Uh, so he's definitely this multi, multi kind of disciplinary, uh, talented. Um, artists. So thank you, Eugene. We're going to hear this piece.
just a few last things. I know it's one o'clock now, and you're going to put the stop now. <laughs> um, okay, so you could hear from that. An elemental thing really is a, is a music that arises from this deep sensory engagement with the, with the instrument. Um, and, and that engagement really leads the form-making activity of, of composition. Um, and you see how this, this seemingly inert block of wood is made malleable because of the way in which the, the performer's um, body, you know, kind of really binds its capacities to this, this, uh, this kind of area of, <laughs> of work through multiple prostheses, you know, through the different mallets and bows and, and you know, Super Bowl and so on, in order to actually um, bring out a whole world of, of, I think of as very cello-like, cellistic techniques, this multiplicity of sound worlds. Um, it also becomes like Bateson's sound walk, you know, where sound shows you the location on, on the plane. Um, it's also a surface for driving on. And finally, this wood block, this humble uh, piece of wood with the slit carved out to provoke, uh, promote Resonance improbably becomes like an orator, a body with a mouth that speaks of the stars. So just to, to turn back a little bit to some of the terms, Borgdorf's um, definitions of artistic research as modes of inquiry offer some valuable ways of thinking about any kind of research. Artistic research is a mode of inquiry that gives us particular vantage points and perspectives for interpreting the world around us. And these perspectival shifts demand the formation of skills, of new and supple capacities of sensing and thinking and acting. And through the modalities of practice, we can gain a further understanding of the pathways through which knowledge is made and shared. Through experimentation or play with the structure and organization of these capacities, we can also arrive at unforeseen results. The art we make is imprinted with the energy of these heightened encounters and that resulting, resulting charge is part of its beauty. <laughs> we expand and deepen our most intimate inner life when we look up at the stars and tell of dreams and stories or ask a block of wood to sing. Thank you.